Welcome to the Running Explained podcast. I'm your host, Elizabeth. I'm a marathoner, coach, and answer seeker. When I first started running at the age of 29, I had so many questions and what felt like nowhere to turn to for answers. And now I'm here to answer all your running questions about anything that you might want to know. If you're a new runner or you've been doing this for a long time, there's always something more to learn about running. So let's get started. My guest this week is Dr. Angie Brown, runner, coach, physical therapist, and founder of the Real Life Runners Training Academy. Angie is here today in her capacity as a coach and runner, not a physical therapist, because we're talking about something that is vitally important to what it means to become a a better runner, and that is learning how to trust the process, trust the training, and trust yourself. And this is something that many runners really struggle with. And that's why we're talking about it today. So please welcome Angie to the show. I hope you enjoyed this episode. This is a lot of fun for both of us. And we covered so much ground that I know is going to be helpful for quite a few of you. Dr. Angie Brown, welcome to the show. I'm excited to have you here. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. So before we get started to talk about what I'm very excited to talk about our topic today, I want to know, how did you become a runner? Oh, that's a fun question. So um, I actually hated running when I was younger. Like I played volleyball, basketball, and softball growing up. So running was always a form of punishment for me. And I absolutely despised it. I thought that I was not a good runner. I had all these stories in my head about my ability and my as a runner and like definitely did not identify as a runner at all. Running was just something that I had to do to condition for other sports. So the way that I actually got into running was in college, I met a guy who was a runner and he actually was running. Um, he had actually just stopped running for the, the team um, at the university that we were running or that we were both going to. And so he loved running, like his whole life was running. And I'm like, this guy's crazy. <laughs> so um, essentially he kind of got me into it. So before him, I ran just to lose weight, to try to get in shape, right? After high school, after I stopped the competitive team sports, you know, you go to college and sometimes the weight creeps on. And so I just would go to the gym and run on the treadmill and I absolutely hated it. And I was just doing it as a means to an end. Like I just wanted to improve my body, lose weight. Like I think what brings a lot of people into running. Um, And then when I met him and he was like talking about running as this thing that he loved to do and he would go out for miles and miles on end and I'm like, I don't know how you think about running this way. And it just started in talking to him, he started to shift my perspective a little bit and started to like people actually enjoy this, you know, and the way that he actually got me to start liking running is that he introduced me to interval training because that to me was so fun when like the thought of going out just for a long slow distance run was just mind numbing to me i just could not find any sort of joy enjoyment in it whatsoever and of course i was pushing myself too hard on every run because i don't know you know i didn't know now or then what i know now um so he started me off with interval training so when i had this like doing some fart licks and those kind, kinds of workouts where i could just push hard for a minute and then i could have a walking break or then i could go easy and just like playing with it it just brought a lot more fun and joy into it and then you know after college um i went on to physical therapy school to get my doctorate and when you're around other people that are also studying to be physical therapists, it's just a very health and fitness minded community, everybody. So it was like, we went to class for eight hours, seven hours a day, and then everyone would just go to the gym afterwards. So it just became part of the lifestyle. And then I just started to really get into running that way and did some 5Ks, some triathlons, and you know, the rest is history, they should say. And that's such a common entry point. And the reason I ask this question is that I, I want to showcase that there really is no one way to become a runner and that yeah. people who, you know, I think when you are newer to the community, you see these people who are, are runners and you think, gee, if that person is running this distance or if that person's running this time, they must have been a standout in high school, like a college phenom. And so many of us who are runners Like I, you know, I grew up playing sports. I didn't run intentionally like on my own, except to lose weight or to train for my other sports, you know, that running was like, oh my God, who runs on purpose intentionally without any other reason. Right. Right. Um, 
but then and, and then to have that transition i think is really natural for a lot of people but that is a really interesting point and i think it really uh it goes into our conversation today about learning how to trust the process and trust your training mm -hmm. because when you make the shift from running for those purely external extrinsic reasons like mm -hmm. I must run for my other sport or running is part of my weight management or running is something I use to punish myself for mm -hmm. X, Y, Z to I'm running because I want to, I'm running because I have these running oriented goals. Mm -hmm. Um, it is a, an entirely different way of thinking about the sport of running and thinking about what you're trying to accomplish mm -hmm. with your running. Yeah, totally agree. Totally agree. It's funny you say you you uh, really only started your introduction to enjoying running was intervals um, because like I think most people we we uh, when we're new we start running and everything's way too hard for me <laughs> um, one of the reasons that I really struggled with longer slower runs when I was newer is that I was like almost afraid to be alone in my head uninterrupted mm -hmm. for that amount of time yeah like, I, I never had to have ran... music. Yeah. Yes, I never ran without music at the beginning. Like the I, the idea of going out on a run without something in my ears was foreign to me. And same thing like when I was even starting to do some of the the races, you know, once I finally started getting into races and started to get into 5Ks and 10Ks and all the things, I always ran with music. And it wasn't until much later on that I even attempted to run without music and kind of see what that would even be like. But it's funny that you say that because, you know, like the way that different people get into running, because I got into running and then I was consistent for a while and I was doing some 5Ks and, and those kinds of things. And I got to the point where I was like, hmm, I wonder if I could get faster, right? Because for my whole life, I, like I said, did not identify as a runner, did not think I was a good runner whatsoever. And then it was just this curiosity. It was like, hmm, I wonder if I could get faster if I actually trained. Because at the time, my husband, he coaches uh, the cross country team at our local high school. And I now cross, I coach with him now. So, and I've been coaching with him now for the past, I think, nine years now. But, um, you know, even at, at early on, it, it was like, well, he obviously knows what he's doing, so he could help me get faster. Like, he does this all the time, you know? But it was that disconnect between other runners and then me, right? It was like I didn't put myself in that same category. And I'll never forget when he ran his first half marathon. It was – our baby was three months old, okay? So it was our, our first kid. She was three months old. He was like, all right, I think I'm going to do this half marathon. I was like, sounds great. So – we're there waiting for him, you know, and my husband is a very talented, naturally talented runner. And so he's coming through in his very first half marathon. He's in second place. And I'm like, holy moly. Right. And so I'm just like, obviously we're cheering like crazy and he runs past and he finishes the race. He ran like a one eleven. I mean, just like Oof. blazing. Right. Yeah. In my, in my mind. So, um, that's blazing for I'm, most people. Yeah. 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 But, so as I'm standing there, though, because now I'm watching everyone else come through and I'm seeing so many different types of people, right? I'm seeing, you know, all genders, all cultures, all body sizes, all ages. Like there was, it was, everybody was there. And I was like, well, I mean, it was the first time that I was like, I wonder if I could do this, you know? Like it was just that, again, that curiosity, which I think is like one of my favorite emotions. It's one of my favorite things to tap into is just curiosity because I think that we as runners tend to place so much pressure on ourselves and that also goes along with kind of trusting the process. And so trying to kind of take some of that pressure off ourselves and just like tap into curiosity of like, what if I can, you know, like, I wonder if I could. And I was like, I mean, if, if these people can do it, I'm sure I could do it. Like I've got this guy, he can train me, <laughs> you know, like, and so that was one of those eye-opening moments that led me down the path of like where I am today. And I'll never forget, you know, training for my first half and completing my first half and the feeling that I had right then of like crossing the finish line. And I was like, I, I did that, you know? And like, that's the feeling that I want every runner to have is like, and it, it doesn't have to happen when you cross a finish line. Cause I don't believe you have to race to be a runner, but you can just have that sensation after your Thursday morning run, if you want to, right? Like, 
I did that. Like, it's cold outside. It's dark outside. And I still got up and I did this for myself. And I'm the one that did it. And that's such an empowering. That's why I think is running is such an empowerment, like a, a vehicle for empowerment in our own, own lives. I always think about running as it, when you when you are, it's not just about the running, right? The running teaches you how to how to live, basically. Totally. Like running teaches you life skills. It teaches yep. you perseverance it teaches you patience it teaches mm -hmm. you to dream big but it teaches you to like take it day by day yep. you know it teaches you to listen to your body it teaches you to fuel for what you're like it teaches you all these things that just help you become mm -hmm. like a better person yes and i hopefully also become a better runner as part of the deal absolutely and like that's really the whole reason that my husband and i started our company in our podcast is like we named our company Real Life Runners for that reason, because it's running in your real life. It's how running helps us become better versions of ourselves in our real life and how we also need to take real life and put that into our running as well. Like we don't train on an island. We have to incorporate the two to work together. So I could not agree with you more on that. Like I think that running is one of those things that just helps us to continue to elevate ourselves in all areas of our lives. I want to talk about this idea of the process because yes. our broad topic today, our broad theme of our conversation is how do you learn to trust the process? Like how mm -hmm. do you learn to trust the training, trust the process, yeah. trust what you're doing is going to get you to where you're trying to go. Mm -hmm. But that it all starts with the fact that it is a process and going back to, you know, what we, what we, uh, preconceptions or things that we think we know about the running community at large is that so often, um, you know, we can look at these runners who are achieving um, X, Y, Z, whatever things that they're achieving and think that they must have sprung fully formed from the earth, <laughs> knowing how to do that, right? With that, like it was almost no training. They went and, you know, qualified for Boston or, right. you know, whatever it was. Um, but that every, whatever we're trying to do, as individuals in this sport, we are individually going to go through a process that makes us better. And at the end of the day, it's not just a process for each training cycle, but it is a, a lifelong process. Mm -hmm. Um, and that sometimes when you have runners who are saying like, Oh, I could, I could never do that, whatever that is. And what you just said earlier, it's like, well, what if, what if you could though? Like, what if you tried, um, mm -hmm. just because you can't do it now, doesn't mean you can't do it in the future. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that, you know, speaking back to kind of that natural ability and runners sprung from the womb, like I, like I said, was my vision of a runner was my husband and he was a division one collegiate runner. Right. So I'm like, compare, comparing myself to him, like, forget it. There's, there's no comparison. People are like, Oh, it's so cute. You guys are both runners. Do you go out and run together. I'm like, no, <laughs> not at all like his warm-up is like my mile PR right like so it's just so but it's it's understanding that we all have a starting point and I in talking to him it's so funny because he would have the same doubts the same questions the same struggles with his running it was just happening at different paces right he and I were having the same things and it's funny because we've we talk about this all the time, but he's like, you're one of my running partners. Like you're one of my running buddies, even though we never actually run together. The only time we've ever like run together is on side by side treadmills, you know, when at the gym and going different paces. Right. So, um, but he's, the way that we talk about it is you don't have to run right next to somebody for that person to be your training partner. It's because you, since you're both runners, you both understand the same struggles. All runners go through the same struggles regardless of what that pace is because running just by its nature is a more goal-oriented sport, I think. And I think that it attracts people that tend to be more goal-oriented people that want to challenge themselves, that want to improve themselves in some way. And so it doesn't actually matter what the number on the clock is or what the number on your smartwatch is. We're all trying to improve. And when I realized that he was struggling with the same types of things that I was, it, it almost puts you on a level playing field because it's just, it's the same stuff. It just kind of slightly different, you know, numbers. And so when people look at the elites, the professionals, um, even like local elites, 
and put them on a pedestal or a different platform, I think that that is doing every, like the, the sport of running a disservice because, you know, there's always all these memes out there that's that says a mile is still a mile, right? A, a six minute mile is as long as a 13 minute mile. Like we're all running the same distance. If you, if you run a marathon or a half marathon, you're still running the same distance regardless of the pace. And I also love my husband's perspective on that too, because he thinks that it's harder for people for people to run like a four or five, six hour marathon, then him that's running, you know, two and a half hours, he's like, because you're out there for so much longer. You know, the, the wear and tear and the toll that that takes on you both mentally and physically, he's like, I would argue that that's harder in a lot of ways than running a faster marathon. So, you know, it's really just all about that perspective, I think. And that's really what I think kind of brings us to that idea of trust in the process because if you think about it like what is trust you know i looked it up on, on the dictionary dictionary.com today and it's like trust is a firm belief in the re reliability truth ability or strength of someone or something like that is the dictionary definition of trust so it's a belief so if trust is a belief and a belief is simply a thought then really all we have to do in order to trust the process more is to start thinking about our training differently, right? Because our thoughts drive all of the actions that we either take or don't take in our life. And then those actions that we either choose to take or choose not to take lead to whatever outcomes that we have. So to your point, yeah, you might not be able to do the thing right now, but if you start thinking about it differently, if you start seeing possibility, maybe you're not to the point where you can say, oh yeah, I'm definitely gonna run a BQ one day, but you're like, but what if I tried? What if I could, right? Just kind of opening up the door to it and, and seeing curiosity and possibility, then would you be willing to start to, to do the work that could make that outcome become a reality? That's, I mean, all of that, I guess that's such a fascinating look at kind of, I think all aspects of the sport it is, we are all at the end of the day, facing the same challenges as we go through our own individual processes. It's just, we tend to ascribe, um, and I think we do this with a lot of things, people who tend to be very good at things naturally, right? Mm -hmm. We think they, they must not have struggled. And I, you know, I grew up, um, uh, uh, playing the violin and singing and you know there was always like the one kid mm -hmm. who is like the 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 prodigy right like yeah. literally the prodigy violinist and they still practiced right like you know mm -hmm. Elliot Kipchoge still trains consistently yeah. year round <laughs> right like division one athletes are still doing their training having doubts in their repeats like having mm -hmm. days where they feel like total crap and I think, you know, thinking that, oh, well, they just must have it easier. It's like, actually, none of us have it easy, right? Mm -hmm. All of us have to work for where we're trying to get to. And for some of us, unfortunately, it takes a little bit longer time or more work than somebody else to get to the place we're trying to go. It doesn't mean that it's not worth it. It doesn't mean you shouldn't try. It just means that we're all on different journeys. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that, like, if we try to figure out how to trust the process first, I think that it's important for us to understand the purpose of our running. Because I think that a lot of runners, they start running and it, without that clear specific reason, right? They start running to get in shape or they start running to, to lose weight. And then they start to like see, oh, like, I wonder if I could get faster or, or I, I, maybe I want to run a 5K now. Now I run a, run a 10K. Um, and what I see a lot, and I'm sure you do too, like in your coaching, is that they also try to focus on multiple goals all at the same time, right? So it's hard to achieve something if A, it's not well-defined, and if B, you're, try you're trying to split your focus between multiple areas. So I think, you know, going back to trusting the process, I think it's first important for us to get clear on like, what is the purpose of my running and what is the goal that I'm actually working towards and can you focus on one goal at a time because I think you know that is the way that we are going to be able to achieve lots of different things in our lives like when people come in to our coaching program I'm always like all right what do you want to achieve and they're like well I want to run faster I want to run longer and I want to do this and I want to get you know I've got this injury that I'm rehabbing and it's like and I'm What's your timeline? I was like, oh, well, I've already signed up for a half marathon in two months. And I'm like, oh, Lord, have mercy, right? And it's like, 
we can do anything. Like I truly believe that we have so much that we are capable of if we honor ourselves and if we give ourselves the right timeline. And so many times we wanna just rush the process. We want results yesterday. And if we just decide, okay, here are some of my goals and it, like here's my long-term goal or here are multiple goals that I want to achieve, cool, pick one. Let's focus on one at a time and then like stack, we can start stacking them together. And that kind of, you know, we can talk about different ways to, to set goals and, and different ways that we can use training cycles in that, but that's really what we like to help people do is get really, really clear on what goal it is that they want to achieve. Because I like to think about this, um, you know, I've got two kids and we cook dinner a lot. And so it's like, if you have multiple pots on the stove and something in the oven and your kids need help with their homework, how effective are you going to be if you're trying to do all of that at the same time? You know, most and what's likely, the likely is that something's going to burn, right? <laughs> something's going to burn. Something's going to boil over. Like something's going to happen, right? Versus if you were to just focus on just cooking dinner or focus just on helping your kids with their homework, then I think you would be a lot more effective. And the same thing goes for our running. And I think is a really hard um, thing. And I, obviously, I think that you and I have a very similar approach to the sport in that we're big on education. Like, obviously, the reason I do what I do is that I firmly believe if people understand why they're being asked to do something, they're going to a thousand times more likely to do it, right? So yes. it's like, why do we run easy on our easy days? What is your lactate threshold? Why can't you run 30 miles in preparation for your marathon, et cetera, et cetera? Yes. Um, but that, that choosing the one goal at a time, people are like, mm -hmm. well, I, why can't I uh, run a 10K PR while training for my marathon and also get my, make my easy pace get faster, mm -hmm. right? It's like, yeah. well, you know, and when you're new, you know, I think it's really easy. You see a lot of progress in many areas. Mm -hmm. um, you can do anything and everything gets better. You can yes. do any kind of training and everything's going to get faster and you're going to yes. run longer, right? But then if, as you kind of get over that initial like, okay, you did something and it worked. Now you need to get more specific in your training and there are going to be things you need to focus on. Mm -hmm. But the timeline that we're usually looking at on this stuff, a single training cycle could be three, four, maybe even five months. It's that mm -hmm. we don't, we, I say broadly we, humans love instant gratification mm -hmm. and we love immediate feedback, right? So if I'm telling you, we are going to be working on this one goal for the next five months and you are not going to see progress day over day, even though the process is working, mm -hmm. that's a really big ask for me, to, for me to put forward. Yeah, I agree. And I think that people have a hard time wrapping their heads around that. But I also love that you are that candid with your clients because that's that's how I am as well because I'm not here to sugarcoat anything like this is not I'm not going to promise you results tomorrow if you start today because that's unrealistic and I, I don't want to be someone that's going to ever lead someone you know it, this is not like a, a bait and switch type of thing here like let's let's be honest with our people and and let them know what they're in for and you know when you when they when you said before about someone that wants to you know, run longer and set their 10 KPR in the process of training for their marathon and, and all of that, I say, okay, maybe like that, that could happen, right? All while my easy pace is getting faster. Maybe, maybe that will happen. I don't know how your body is going to respond, but if we just focus on one, the other ones are more likely to happen versus if we're trying to focus on all of those things at the same time. Like if we can just kind of keep our eye on the prize and trust our training say, okay, this is what I want to do. Then you might just hit some of those other cool things along the way. And, and, and that to me would be like icing on the cake, but that's not our focus. And I think that that's where it becomes harder. And that's why it's so important for you to trust the plan, you know, to, to find a plan or a coach or whatever it is that you're using to guide your training. You have to have trust in that thing as well. And I think a lot of people, they question it, which is totally fine until you decide, right? I tell people, by all means, do your research. Like, let's g give you the research. Lord knows we have everything at our fingertips now, right? And, and that's when a lot of people, they come to me because they're, they're like, there's so much, I'm so overwhelmed. I have no idea where to start. And I think that 
that's when information can be a blessing and a curse because it's fantastic that we have all of this information at our fingertips, but how do we distill it down to actually know what's going to work for me in my life and the, the goals that I have? And I think that people can just find themselves in on Google or on YouTube and just going down these rabbit holes and not like they just get so overwhelmed that it just leads them to not taking any action at all. So by all means, do the research, you know, but find sources that you know that you can trust. Find sources that are going to do the research for you and help you understand it and help you apply it. Then that's going to save you so much time, so much frustration, so much energy in that. And then you have the plan and you can just decide to trust the plan and follow the plan. And then when the plan's done, you assess, right? What are the results that I that I got, but we have to make sure that we're giving that plan enough time to work, enough reasonable time to work before throwing in the towel. You can't do a plan for two weeks and say, oh, it's not working, I'm not getting any faster. You have to give it enough time to actually see and allow your body to make those adaptations because running is a sport that we don't make super fast adaptations, especially once we've been doing it for a while. You know, like you said, at the beginning, sure, at the beginning we make all sorts of progress, and that can be something, you know, back to your point of immediate gratification, like we're getting that constant dopamine hit on because we're making progress and we're seeing ourselves get faster. And, you know, the first week maybe you can only run a mile, and the next week you can run two because your body starts adapting. But that's not how progress goes, right? We always say progress is not linear. Progress kind of looks like the stock market and you're, there's going to be ups and downs, but the goal is to be trending in the right direction. So how do we, how do we believe that? It's just the way we think about it. You know, it's just the like understanding that this is what I've chosen to do. This is the plan that I've chosen. This is the coach that I've chosen. This is what I'm going to do. Now I'm going to commit to it for eight weeks, 12 weeks, 16 weeks, and then we'll see at the end what's happening. And that's not to say that we shouldn't be assessing along the way, because obviously life happens. There are times that we need to adjust. There's not, you know, I'm not saying that we should just stick our heads down and just power through no matter what, because we definitely need to adjust if, if life happens. But we also have to make sure that we're giving ourselves enough of a timeline to really see if things are working before we just decide to change things. And that's not to say, like you said, we're not, we're not just saying like, oh, blindly trust the process and don't ask questions, right? It's right. Like my Definitely job and not. your job, my job and your job is not to tell an athlete, like, just shut up and do what I say, right? Like, no. I, I want you to know why you're being asked to do something. Absolutely. One, because I think it's cool. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Two, because I think, like I said, I think education breeds more engaged and informed athletes who are then going to mm -hmm. be able to do make continually makes their own smart decisions in mm -hmm. their training, right? Because yeah. I cannot be there even as your one-on-one -on -one coach. Like I'm not, I don't live with you, right? I don't hold <laughs> your hand through every single right. run that you're doing. And so, you know, if we can create these educated, informed athletes who do trust the process, who can in a workout or in a run or in a race, make a smart decision mm -hmm. um, rather than a not smart decision about whatever the thing is, then, then that is, then we've done our jobs correctly, right? Absolutely. Yeah. I, I definitely believe in empowering athletes with that information. And I, I think it, it sounds like you and I are very similar, you know, with, with that, like I'm all about education. I'm all about empowering my athletes to understand this, right? Like I tell them, I, I would love to work with you for a long time, but if if you can do it on your own, that's even better. Like this is what I used to tell my patients when I was, you know, a clinical physical therapist. I'm, I'm not really practicing in the clinic anymore, but um, at that time, I, I used to tell them, I said, I don't want you coming back to see me. I like you. If you want to come back and, and say hi, fantastic. I'd love a visit, but I don't want you to have to come back and see me because that, t to me, that means I didn't do my job. You know, if I'm not teaching you the right exercises, why these exercises are important so that you can continue to get stronger when you leave your time in PT, then I haven't done my job correctly, right? And so I want you to be able to have the tools and the resources to, to do this for the rest of your life, whether that's, you know, rehabbing an injury or running and really trying to chase and see what you're capable of um, with your performance. Let's talk about that element of building trust. And it, it, you know, I think it's, depending on the athlete, there's either, you know, I've had athletes come to me and say, 
I don't, I, 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 uh, I intellectually understand these different concepts. They're like, I understand this concept of aerobic capacity. And I understand that the research says that the majority of my endurance training should be easy effort. And I, I understand why I can't do all my longs run and marathon goal pace, like all that kind of, and they say, well, I, I, I don't necessarily believe that, but I believe you coach Elizabeth. So mm -hmm. I'm going to let you guide my training. Right. And so that's a great feeling to be like, cool. So I can, we can kind of connect the dots there and say, you know, intellectually you say you understand, right. You don't trust. I think the, what you believe, like, like mm -hmm. I read it on a book and we're like, I don't know, that doesn't sound great, but I don't know. This person sounds pretty great. I'm going to trust her opinion. And then I've also worked with athletes who are um, so immediately bought in, like they read one book, like mm -hmm. they read 80, 20 running and they're like, I'm in all in, I don't care. Let's do this. I have zero further questions. I have, I just want to do it correctly. Yeah. <laughs> and then you have the, th the third athlete, which I think is the hardest is that you, and this is where I kind of come from, right? I'm like, uh, you know, uh, trust, but verify and ask further questions, right? Which is how I got into do what I do. And I'm always happy. Like I love discussing this type of stuff, but at the end of the day, if I'm working with an athlete who is, I am reframing and reframing and representing and re-educating on the same relative basic concepts, and they are still distrustful of the process. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that this is like, you know, here, but at some point it is within each of us to learn how to trust what we're doing. Right. So like, it's like, I can, I, our athlete is to, our job is to lead the athlete to the education and allow them to draw their own conclusions. Some of them draw conclusions more simply or easily or quickly. Mm -hmm. Some athletes are a hard sell. And it's, it's, that is, I think one of the more challenging parts of being a running coach is working with an athlete who like doesn't, isn't bought in and you can't quite figure out how to get them to buy in, even with demonstrations of how the process is benefiting them. Mm -hmm. Right. And so that's a frustration to have on a coaching side, but as an athlete, that's also a very scary and frustrating place to be in as the athlete, mm -hmm. if you are living in this place of like constant doubt and fear about always feeling like what you're doing in your training, you're like, I don't trust that this is going to work. I don't trust that slowing down is going to help me. I don't trust that this is going to help me get faster. I don't trust that, um, you know, I may not see progress for a couple weeks or months, but it's still going to benefit me on race day. Yeah. Right. So I think that it kind of acknowledging both sides of that process and that, you know, it, it is very tricky for some people to kind of open their hearts, if you will, to the process and learn to just kind of let go a little bit. Yeah. When I encounter um, people like that, I often just ask why I try to get really curious, like kind of going back to that curiosity piece. And I, I say, well, why don't you trust this? Right. And like, what is it? Like, what did something happen in the past where they trusted? Some, maybe do they have an issue with just trust in their life? Right. Because going back to how running is really just a reflection of a lot of other stuff in our life. Do they just have an issue trusting and believing in other people? in a process in themselves right do they believe enough in themselves do they actually believe that they are capable of the outcome that they want like can we get that deep right and and like some people don't like to go there you know like i'm one of those people in general not just as a coach that just likes to ask uncomfortable questions because i'm a naturally curious person so i just like ask questions and like some some people will be like angie that's not really appropriate i'm like oh really i'm like I'm, but i'm just curious you know like it's 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 from a place of just genuine curiosity and so one of the things that i will like to to ask people if if i feel like someone's kind of if i'm bumping up against a wall is well what if you did believe that it was possible? Or what if you did trust the process? What do you think would be possible if you did? And kind of just have them go to like fairy tale land for a bit. Like just, just go with me for a second, you know? Just play along and just say like, what if we just tried this? Like what if we 
try this on. Like we're trying on a thought like we try on a piece of clothing. So if you did trust the process, if you did believe that running slower could actually help you get faster, what would that feel like? What would that look like in your life? How would you feel if 80% of your runs actually felt good? You know, like, and like have them just start to actually think about it. And if they want to continue to fight back, okay. But I think that there's a, an under, like a deeply underseated thing that's going on with someone like that. And there's, and I, so I typically find with athletes who are in this place um, that they either have a, a, a history of um, rigidly defining success in very specific ways. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that usually has to do it. And, and the, honestly, like I would say probably 95 times out of a hundred, the, the topic about learning to trust the training is one learning that slowing down on your easy days helps you mm -hmm. in the long run. Yep. And two, that it actually does just take a long time for some of this stuff to actually work. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's that it's gonna, you need to run slowly than you have previously and that you may, you know, slower than you might want to. And it's going to take longer than you want it to in most situations. And so this usually, you know, an athlete who is typically, uh, you know, this sport tends to, a type, uh, tends to attract people who are, you know, very high achieving in other areas of their life, who tend to be very organized, tend to, I'm not one of them, but other people are, um, who tend to have in, in other areas of their life set and achieved very specific goals on their own time frame, And then to be confronted with a sport where they're saying, no, I, I, in the way that I define success, it's not running slower than X minute per mile, right? No matter what the effort is, or no, I should be able to achieve this in four months or less, mm -hmm. right? And to say, um, and, and so if we kind of unpack how we measure success and progress and what we're even trying to do here, mm -hmm. you know, one of the things I asked, a I've used this on a couple runners actually. And I said to you, you know, I'm not in the business of making guarantees. This is not what I do. But I said, what if I could guarantee, what if I could guarantee you mm -hmm. that by slowing down to X pace range, easy efforts on, on your easy days, what if I could guarantee you that you would hit your race day goal in three months? Mm -hmm. And if they still say, I don't know, then we, then I know we are having a conversation that has absolutely nothing to do about running. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that, so much of it goes back to the ego, you know, like we have this idea, exactly what you're saying of what success looks like or of what we're capable of. And we've identified ourselves in that way and slowing down. Cause there's a lot of people that I talk to that identify as a slow runner. They're like, Oh, I'm, I'm just a really slow runner. And you want me to be even slower. And I'm like, yes. They're like, but, but I'm already slow. They already, I'm already at the back of the pack or I'm already this, or I'm already that. So in their minds, they've just identified themselves with that thing. And our brain, like once we create an identity for ourselves, that's how our brain measures everything in our life because that's, that's who we are. So if you're telling me, well, I, I have to run slower, that, that doesn't mesh, that doesn't you know, connect with the identity that I've already created for myself or that the ego that I have that says, you know what, if my watch says a time that's slower than I want it to, that doesn't actually mean anything about me. That doesn't mean that I'm a slow runner. That doesn't mean that I'm a bad runner, but people choose to make it mean that they, they choose to make it mean, well, if I see a, a slower number or a bigger number on my watch, that means that this isn't working. And so it's, it's trying to flip the script of, no, that actually means that it is working. So you're actually asking them to reverse a thought, a, a belief that they have. And we as humans don't do that easily, you know? And that's, I think that goes back to that immediate gratification because we are currently in a culture where, in a society where everything is at our fingertips. We can have, you know, dinner delivered to us in 20 minutes we can have now like you can order something on amazon it can get there the same day right these we're, we're so used to things happening and happening so quickly that now we're asking you to trust us and to put in the work and to not see results for a little while people have a hard time wrapping their brains around that and it's because it's a it's a complete paradigm shift 
Something I also see a lot, and this is something I work with so much with my runners of, of all experience levels and pace ranges, is learning how to divorce oneself from the numbers in, in many contexts, right? Not just easy days, not just, you know, slow, fast, whatever it is, but that, you know, really trying to cultivate what does this feel like? Right. Mm -hmm. And, and there are some athletes I work with, I'm like, I need you to go do this. Uh, I want you to go put a piece of tape over your watch and do this workout. Mm -hmm. Like, I do not want you to look at your watch. I do not want you to think that, you know, how fast you're going. I want you to run this workout or run this run purely based on the perceived effort, uh, ranges that we're going for. And that freaks people out oh, yeah. right we are as a as a culture a running culture so glued to the watch data mm -hmm. as as like the gospel right mm -hmm. oh if my watch said i was running this pace must be true right yep. um irrespective of how it feels or if that mm -hmm. was the right pace for the day or if you could have run faster uh right. That that learning to tune into oneself, I think, is the really the end game of where we're trying to get to in trusting the process, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and that is a huge learning curve for a lot of runners. Yeah, because it forces us to trust ourselves. And we have been conditioned to not trust ourselves in a lot of ways. And I think that as great as all of these smart watches are and all of these smart devices, they have basically shifted our focus from internal to external of like, I don't know what it feels like in my body. I don't know what it should feel like in my body because I'm just going to look at my watch and let my watch tell me if I'm doing it right. Right. And it's also, is there even a right way and a wrong way? Like we could get into a whole debate and discussion on that. There, what is the, the right way or the wrong way? And I always like to tell people, why did you get into running in the first place? Like always kind of like, sometimes people get so granular. They like, they get so narrowly focused on like hitting that one number or achieving that one specific goal that they lose sight of why they even started running in the first place. And it's like, okay, wait, let's just pause and just take a step back and it's like, are you trying to bring more joy into your life? Are you trying to challenge yourself as an individual? Like, let's go back a little bit because you've gotten so hyper-focused on this one tiny thing. Like, you know, I'll have athletes all the time when, when, they're, when they come in and they're, they're learning what it is to run by effort. They're like, well, but what heart rate is that? And I'm like, that's not what we're doing here, right? Like, they, they, can, they're, they can correlate, but they're not the same, right? What I'm asking you to do is tap in, like you said, tune in, to your body and see how you're feeling. How, how do my legs feel? How does my breathing feel? Am I able to just casually have a conversation or am I gasping for air? And heart rate is not always accurate on these little devices on our watch, on, on our wrist. So if you are able to actually tune in, you're gonna be much better prepared for race day or for what you know your long run on the weekend because we all know that Sometimes the watch goes wonky. Sometimes it doesn't read our heart rate correctly. Sometimes it doesn't read our pace correctly. I know people, I feel like Chicago is infamous for this, you know, the Chicago Marathon. Like you, you're, when you're running through the huge buildings, like people's paces are all over the place and then they're, they have no idea what to do. They're completely lost because they don't know what it actually should feel like in their body. So that trust in ourselves in us actually knowing our bodies best like I tell people you know your body better than I do you've lived with it for 60 years or 40 years or whatever it is so it's my job to tell you okay this is how it should possibly feel but then you have to kind of see what that actually feels like in yourself I'm a big proponent of using heart rate in training like it's because I think it's a really accessible metric as long as the mm -hmm. data that we're using is accurate and right. to be honest if you're only using your watch to measure your heart rate I mean you got like a 50 50 chance of it being accurate right mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know how many other things in your life you take 50 50 chances on but those odds are not great <laughs> Right, exactly. And, the, you know, so heart rate, I think, can be a helpful metric. It's just not the be all end all that people want it to be. It's so funny that you say it about, I mean, the pace. I remember when I started running and I was living in Florida and I was a classic 
new runner, everything too hard, like didn't even know, yep. just, you know, everything. I, I, I picked a pace and that was the pace I ran. Yep. And I was so obsessed with running very specific paces, especially in the first year that I was running. And I had this one like 10K loop that I could, from my house, I could go out my front door and then go through my neighborhood, go to another neighborhood, go around a lake, come back. And it was like exactly 10K. Um, and I knew down to like, you know, almost a foot where on that loop, the GPS drop points were, <laughs> I, like, I knew it. Like I, and I was, pa- if I passed, like if I passed the bench, I knew not to check my watch because my pace would be off because my pace, the GPS would always drop. Like it was just ridiculous. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, if, you know, kind of looking back, I'm like, yeah, and where I run now, like my whole neighborhood, the GPS sucks. Like I can't even use GPS in my neighborhood. And I think mm-hmm. that's a really good, I think, um, it's a, if you told me six years ago, one day you will live in a neighborhood where you can't even trust your GPS and you're going to have to go practically watchless <laughs> on all your runs <laughs> at your front door. Um, I would have freaked out, right? Mm-hmm. Because I needed what I thought at the time. And I think this is very common. I thought that by, a uh, uh, being so obsessed with those data points, I thought that was actually getting that was moving me in the right direction Mm -hmm. and i didn't understand at the time that it was actually counterproductive to be so obsessed to try to quantify everything practically Mm -hmm. every minute of every run that i was on i would like look you know i i I thought that i was doing the right thing i thought that by being so dialed into those data points it was helping and it wasn't yeah yeah and how much stress did that add to your run and then increase your effort level because you were so hyper-focused on those exact data points, right? Like what happened, you know, what was it like to run before we had watches at all? Like people have been running for centuries and didn't have any of this stuff. And one of the reasons I think that's another, um, you know, listening to you talk there, it made me think of people that get into running for stress relief and for mental health, right? Because there's a lot of runners that believe like running is my therapy, which that's a whole different topic of conversation, right? But there are definitely mental benefits for running. But if you are so hyper-focused on the paces and hitting those exact pace ranges and exact heart rates, wouldn't you argue that that would take out some of that joy and some of that stress relief that running you that you say you get from running right like and that's kind of where I think that some people get lost they start to go down this path maybe they start running for stress relief and they're like oh my god running's amazing it feels so good and then they're like oh and let me see if I can get faster and then they just kind of start going down this rabbit hole of like now I want to increase my pace and it's like whoa 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 like back up remember why you started running in the first place like it seems like you're way more stressed about your running now than you were when you first started and you're, you're forgotten why you started in the first place. I used to have this big, uh, this big spreadsheet where I would, you know, and I thought like the pros track their data and they use all these fancy tools and, you know, and so I would take all my data from my every run. This is when I, when I had time to do this. Yeah. Um, and I would, I had this giant spreadsheet and I would put in like all these different metrics and I'd have, I had all these little like formulas and I would like chart everything and graph everything and draw, draw trend lines. Nice. So one of the reasons I started this was because I wanted to prove to myself that my easy effort paces were getting faster. Like it's weird that what we sometimes focus on as runners. Mm-hmm. So it's like when I discovered easy running and made that shift into like, oh, this is what actually training is supposed to be like. And that eventually started me down the road of becoming a coach and doing what I do today. Um, but I was like, oh, it's cool to see my easy effort pace change. But I'm, but I noticed I'm not seeing it on every single run. Some runs are slower, and then I'll have a run that's a little bit faster, and then some runs are slower, and then I'll have a run. And, but and I noticed, like, oh, but in the grand scheme of things, the trend line data, if I plot mm-hmm. all this information, the trend line is heading in the downward direction, aka I was getting faster. Um, and so, I no longer do that. I haven't done that in years, but that was really my introduction to as funny as it sounds, letting go of the, Mm -hmm. of the little data points because I was 
focusing on not what any single run was, but I was focusing on the big picture. And I was looking Mm -hmm. at six, 12 months of data at a time Mm -hmm. and saying, really, the only thing that matters here is the long term, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And when we're looking at truly making progress, right? Whatever, however we want to, want to define progress for a lot of people that's getting faster for some people that's just being able to sustain what they're currently doing for some people it's just running longer at any pace. Mm -hmm. Typically that progress is coming in years, right? Not weeks, definitely not days, sometimes months, but often years. Right. And we talked about the, you know, mentioning the beginning of the podcast episode, you know, some of this stuff, um, you know, either it's going to, you have to run slower than you want to, it's going to take longer than you want it to, is that for some people in some of these goals that they're chasing, it's going to take you years to get there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And are you okay with that? Right. And if you're not, why not? Like, that's what I always like to know is like, I'll sometimes ask people, what's the rush? You know, why, what is the need for these fast results? Because I think that so many times people want to rush the process. And I think that, in a way, running kind of gives that to you because like we were talking about before, how you do make a lot of progress in the beginning. And so then you just kind of expect, oh, this is just how it's going to be, right? But then you always kind of, you hit that plateau point where progress starts to slow down and becomes longer in between those, you know, lines of of progress, um, those upward trends. And that's where I think a lot of the frustration starts to set in for people is understanding that, oh, shoot, I'm on a plateau. I'm not making progress anymore. And what if they understood that the plateau was part of the process? They, every runner hits that plateau. There's going to be some period of time where you are going to either maybe even slow down, maybe even go backwards for a little bit. There, You get sick, right? things get really stressful at work, you have a kid, like life changes, circumstances change. And a lot of people, I think that this is one of the negative sides of of social media. There's a great lot of good things, but there's a lot of negatives. And people see, oh, this woman, she was running beforehand, and then she had a baby. And look at her, she's back, you know, six weeks later, and she's running, she's ran a half marathon and this and they compare themselves to, to that. And that's, that comparison is really what can get a lot of people into trouble and and help um, facilitate this idea of it's not good enough, right? I'm not doing enough because I'm seeing what I think other people are doing, which we never actually have the whole picture, right? We get to see the highlight reel of whatever they want to share with us, but you don't actually see what's happening. You don't see how they're fueling. You don't see how much sleep they're getting. You don't see what the rest of their life looks like. You don't know if they're going to, if they're able to nap in the middle of the day and, and have all these other things at their disposal, but we just see, oh, well, that person did it faster. So I should be able to as well. And if I'm not, that means that I, maybe I'm not as good or maybe I'm not doing enough. And I think that's where a lot of runners get into trouble. So I like to ask people too, like, what if you made it about the process instead of the outcome? Kind of going back to learning how to trust the process, have the outcome. The outcome is great. I like to to have people set big goals. And I like to think of our goals as kind of lighthouses out in the distance. And they give us a direction. They they help us know which way we're going. But then what we have to do is after we set that big goal, let's reverse engineer it. Let's break it down into smaller goals that will like help us Um, like checkpoints along the way, right? That will help us know if we're moving in the right direction. And then let's break that down further into the actual things, the actions, the process that will help us to achieve those goals or give us the best chance to achieve those goals. Because even if we follow the plan and do all the things, there's a chance that you still might not hit the goal. And that doesn't mean that the process didn't work. That, That could just mean it It's going to take a little bit longer than you originally anticipated because we set these goals. Oh, I want to run a a marathon in six months. Fantastic. That's just a guess, right? Like, oh, I think it's going to take six months to train for that, or I'd like it to take six months to train for that. But what if we just decided, oh, okay, like I wasn't wrong about the process. I was just wrong about the timeline. My body just needed a little bit more time and that's okay. Like 
let that be okay, right? And, and try to remove the judgment from that because we want to place all this judgment on it and make it mean that we're not good enough or we're not a good runner or the, this didn't work and the process didn't work because it's obviously easier to point to something outside of ourselves as the reason we didn't achieve our goal. But what if we just said, okay, you know what? This is the process. This is the best plan that I think is going to work. And if, if it works, great. And if it doesn't, then I'll reassess and I'll figure out what my next step is after that. I think it's a really interesting point about um, <laughs> the process. Yes, the, just because the timeline may not have been correct doesn't mean the process was wrong. And I think something mm -hmm. that we don't often talk about in the context of this is that, okay, theoretically or hypothetically, not theoretically, hypothetically, you know, we have a runner who's working towards, say they they have a goal of running a, a sub two hour half marathon and they have what is objectively a great training cycle. They feel good. They're running really well. Things are going well, like no issues, kind of like, yep, solid, right? Um, and they run their race and they miss out on their goal. Let's say they run a 201. Right mm -hmm. now, I think for a lot of people, the knee jerk reaction to going through that would be um, negative, right? Oh my God, like I failed. I, I, that what, you know, I can't, you know, I, I worked so hard. What happened? What's wrong with me? Am mm -hmm. I like, did I, am I the failure? Right. So I think when we, sometimes when we don't achieve these goals, we set out for ourselves, the implicit kind of message that we tell ourselves is if I don't achieve my goal, that must mean I'm, there's something, I'm a failure or something wrong with me, right? I'm not succeeding, I'm failing. And sometimes it just doesn't happen, right? And there's nothing, there just, it, there's nothing wrong with that. Sometimes right. it just doesn't happen on race day for a million reasons that have absolutely nothing to do with who you are or your moral worth as a person or as a human being. You just didn't run as fast as you wanted to. It doesn't mean, like you said, that the process didn't work. It doesn't mean that the process wasn't worth it. It still worked. It was still worth it. You just happened to have a different number on race day than mm -hmm. you wanted to. Mm -hmm. And I think when we break it down to kind of pointing it out and saying, like, if we separate the process from the outcome, which is really hard for a lot of people because the only reason they go through the process is for the outcome. They don't get the outcome. They're very upset. Mm -hmm. We really just separate those out and say, you know, what happens on race day is often a reflection of how your training went. Like rarely will you have an amazing race day off a terrible training cycle, right? Mm -hmm. But you can have a terrible race day off an amazing training cycle, right? That doesn't mm -hmm. negate that the training cycle was amazing. And this mm -hmm. is a really tricky concept as we talk about what is success? What does this look like? You know, what does it mean if you don't achieve your goal? Yeah, I think that that's a, a really interesting thing to look into. And I, I think that, you know, you can't define success in my opinion, this is my belief by whether or not you achieve that specific outcome or not, because the outcome does not determine the success of the journey. Because if you objectively both, you know, subjectively or objectively look at what where you are on race day, even if you didn't achieve the number that you wanted to, are you ahead of where you were 12 weeks ago or 16 weeks ago or six months ago? Actually look at it. And I think that a lot of people don't take that time to acknowledge themselves and don't want to give themselves the credit if they don't get that outcome because they pin their success or their identity on that outcome of, oh, well, I'm a sub two hour half marathoner. That's what I want to be because that means I'm good enough, right? They've decided in their head that if I run a sub two hour half, that means I'm a good runner. So it's the identity that they attach to that. It's the meaning that they attach to that number. The number's just a number. Like I, I always say, you know, going back to like the comparison between my husband and I, for me, my first, you know, I ran my, my first half in, in over two hours. So that was a goal for me. I wanted to get under that two hour mark. His first half marathon was a one eleven. He never thought about the two hour mark, right? That was never even a thing for him. But for some reason, 
people attach a meaning to that number. And I think that that's where we can say, oh, well, if I'm the one that gets to choose what the number means, then I can just change the way that I think about it. And that's easy to say and much harder to do, right? And I think that that's, but that's really where all the power lies is understanding that it's the way that we're thinking about the outcome or the process that is going to make us feel like it was a success or it was a failure. We get to decide what is success, what is failure, because that's not a hard and fast thing. There's not one definition of success. There's not one definition of failure in this world. So what do you want to make it mean? And to me, if you can find joy in the process, you're going to be successful no matter what the clock says because you're growing as an individual, you're growing as a human, you're becoming stronger, you're becoming faster, maybe you've run longer than you ever have before. And so I always encourage people, the first time that you do a race of any distance, I encourage people not to have a time goal. Because I'm like, you don't know what you're capable of. You have no idea. You've never put your body through this. After you've done one, then we can talk about some time goals. But for the first one, just go out there and enjoy the process. Enjoy the fact that you got to the starting line, A, and then finishing the race is like icing on the cake because you've been working for months, maybe years to get to this point, and that deserves to be celebrated regardless of whatever the clock says. And I said, I think it's really tough for, like I said, the people who tend to be hyper, uh, let's call them goal-oriented, in that, you know, they they want to read, quote unquote, success or failure into the training that they're doing, you know, and, mm-hmm. and athletes. And I think it's a very common, you know, um, you know, we can go through a couple weeks of training and things are going really well. And then we have some a day that's just kind of total crap. Right. And then mm-hmm. it's an immediate like spiral of doubt, anxiety and fear. Right. So if you've had three great weeks of training where you felt strong and empowered and capable and you're you're handling your training load you're sleeping well blah 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 blah, and you have one workout that you bomb Mm -hmm. why are you putting so much emphasis on Mm -hmm. that one workout Mm -hmm. right and so and i I think for i mean everybody kind of has their own personality and way they approach it some people are very laid back right and then some people i think tend to be a little bit more of that kind of like anxious, like, oh, what does this mean? What does this mean? What does this mean? Kind of thing. Right. Sometimes it doesn't mean anything, right? Sometimes <laughs> it means you just had a bad day. Sometimes it means, and this is where that life skill comes in, right? If, you know, I always encourage my athletes, you know, one, it, it's not your fault, right? Bad days just happen. But two, mm-hmm. maybe we do want to zoom out. Like you said, your train doesn't happen on an island. I say your train doesn't happen in a vacuum, right? Mm-hmm. The day before, like, where, where, where's your life right now? Did you have a bad night of sleep? Did Are you kind of behind on your fueling? Were you dehydrated? Is your like life super stressful right now? Um, was the weather humid? Was Did you choose a hilly route? Like all these things are we, we runners, as we define kind of like what is success and what is failure, tend mm-hmm. to um, uh, neglect the fact that everything takes place in the context that it takes place in, right? So if you're trying to, uh, compare two runs or two races, you have to understand that they take place in completely different atmospheres and environments, right? So it's it, this is one of the hardest things too is that you you almost can't compare your runs and races to each other because they're all going to be different enough that mm-hmm. it's it's not going to be a fair comparison, right? So if you say, "But last year I ran this time," I'm like, "Yeah, but." this year you were out sick for three months and then your dog died. Like, you know, it's like you're in a different place. Like, Mm -hmm. and I think that's a really hard, uh, hard, um, we like to, we like to find meaning in patterns. We like to look at, like, we think that we're reading something into something that we, in this situation, we can't necessarily. Yeah. Yeah, I totally agree. And it's, it's like the same thing of, you know, weather or environment, like, 13.1 13.1 miles in South Florida in July is not the same thing as 13.1 miles in Napa Valley in March, right? Like the, the weather's different. The terrain is different. Like I've, I've done, you know, halves at, at different places and it's like, oh, like 
I, I, cause I live in Florida. It's flat as heck down here going to somewhere with Hills. Forget it. Like it's, it's a completely different experience and people come to Florida and they, they're like, how do you run in this humidity and heat? And it's like, for me, it's normal. But when I go to, you know, th and this is a great um, connection to what we were talking about before with effort level training, effort level training in August in Florida, a level three, a level two is much different. That pace is much different than, you know, when I go to Ohio to visit my sister and it's 40 degrees and everything feels good, right? Like all of a sudden you can have like a minute difference in your pace and feel have it feel the same so that just proves that easy effort is not one specific pace on your watch because it, it depends on so many different factors including all the lifestyle things that you're you know that you just mentioned of are you sleeping are you fueling are you hydrated what's the stress level in your life is your parent in the hospital are you you know taking care of a two-year-old and a four-year-old like what is going on right now in your life and how does that affect your training because it does right like it it does without a doubt affect how you feel during your training on race day and and during the whole process so if somebody is listening to this and thinking like i i have trouble trusting my training i have trouble tuning into my body like i i feel like i am the person that they're talking about in these situations yeah. um you know what are some some ways that an athlete can start to conceptualize their training or, you know, different things that you've done with athletes that you've worked with to help them kind of learn to let go on some of these, on some of these, I don't want to say hangups, but some of these things that we tend to get overly focused on that are mm -hmm. detrimental to what we're trying to do. Yeah. I think that it's important for us to kind of see other examples too, because, you know, I, I like to, you know, there's, they've done studies on Olympians and there is, this is kind of going back to like getting hung up on that, the results and the outcome as the definition of success, right? Because if you look at Olympians, they work pretty much their whole life to get to the Olympics and to possibly medal at the Olympics, right? Everybody wants to, to win a medal at the Olympics that is, that is training in that way. And their whole life has been centered around getting to the to the Olympics and, and they've found that a lot of Olympians undergo what they call post Olympic depression because when the Olympics are over, well now what? You know, now what? If if you have taken all of your focus on this one outcome, when that outcome either happens or doesn't happen, then a lot of people feel lost. A lot of people feel empty because if it's just about the goal there's an emptiness. And honestly, I've seen it whether or not you achieve it or not, because there's emptiness, even if you do achieve it, right? Even if you are working towards that outcome and you get it, you get this momentary high, this, this, um, excitement, this satisfaction, this elation, but then what? Right. Because at some point it's like, I think probably all of us have had that experience where you cross the finish line, finish line and you're like, sweet. And then you're like, well, now what? You know, like you're, you're automatically thinking about what's, what's the next goal? What's the next race? Because the goal itself is not what creates the satisfaction. It's the process. And it's I, I think some people think, think that the goal is going to change their lives, right? I, agree. I can run. A, a, if I can run a, a marathon, if I can run a sub two hour half, if I can run a 20 minute 5k or whatever your goal is, if I, if I can run a mile without walking, like you, it's, it's not going to change your life. It'll feel good, but mm -hmm. you are, there's always going to be something more like Elliot Kipchoge is still trying to run a sub two hour half marathon. I assume yeah. in open competition, like don't think that, you know, if you set all, put all of your eggs in this one basket, like then what, like you said, um, yeah. it's not going to change your life. It's just simply See, a stepping stone in the, in the path that you're on. See, I would argue that it will change your life though, no. but the attainment of the goal is not what changes your life. It's the work that you put in. It's the process that you went through in a, into, you know, achieving that goal. And then really how much control do we have over that outcome? We don't like, and this is the other part is 
I try to help people sometimes release the idea that they have any sort of control over it because they don't. We don't have any control of what happens on race day. Sometimes, like you said, you can have the best training cycle and for some reason you have GI upset on race day or it's way hotter or more humid than you expected it to be or, you know, your, your, your kid was up, woke you up at 2 a.m. and you didn't sleep. Like, who knows what it was, right? But something happened and your race – you didn't get the outcome that you wanted, but you actually don't have control over that. The only part that we actually have control over is the process. We have control on whether or not we go out for a run every day. We have control over how hard we push ourselves on a run. We have control over allowing it to be easy. We have control over whether or not we're doing strength training to help prepare us in the best way possible. We have control over drinking enough water, over going to bed and to get as much sleep as we have. We have those are the things. That's the process. We have control over the process. We do not have control over the outcome at all. And and the thought that we do I think is what leads a lot of people into trouble. And so if I can help them see that and help them release, like all you can do is control the process and then you can let it go and just say, I've done what I can. Now I'm going to go out and I'm going to do my best and whatever happens, happens. And that obviously is a hard thing, but it, it does help some people understand because they, they do want, like as runners, we do want this sense of control. And so it's like, okay, here are the things you can control, and now that's the thing you have to kind of release. And sometimes I hear from from some runners who tell me like, "But I'm physically incapable of running that slow on my on my easy runs, or you know, whatever <laughs> thing is." I'm like, "Is somebody blackmailing you? Like, is somebody <laughs> forcing you to run faster than you should?" Yeah, you you, and that's I think the really that is a a, a blessing and a curse. That is both like. Uh, thrilling in its freedom and terrifying in its implication mm -hmm. that I am the only person in charge of what I do today, yeah. right? I am the person in charge of getting out for my run. And I am the person in charge of making sure that run is executed the way it's supposed to be. And I am the person in charge of making sure that I hydrate and I refuel and I am, you know, so, um, but it is, it is the, the little things, these tiny little talk about being an athlete who makes smart decisions in their training, because even if you're coached, you are the one who has to execute this is that if you can make these smart decisions day in, day out in your life and in your training, they will add up and put you into a position where you're more likely to go after those outcome goals that you have been chasing. Exactly. And, you know, when people say that I'm physically incapable of, of running slower, I say, well, then walk. Yep. And they're like, what? And yep. I'm like, then you need to add walking breaks. Mm -hmm. Like you can do a run walk. And like that is not okay with a lot of people, you know, because – again, going back to those thoughts, like they've decided that if, to be a runner, and I'm using air quotes, to be a runner, that means I can't take walking breaks. But that's just not true. That's just something that you've decided, you know, that a, a real runner doesn't take walking breaks. Like running, run walking is a very good strategy for a lot of people. And it is a fantastic way to actually keep your easy runs easy. If you are the kind of person that has a hard time slowing yourself down, if you feel like your running form gets wonky when you slow yourself down, like if people can't maintain a good running form and, um, then a run walk is a fantastic way to kind of allow yourself the benefit of getting those easy, keeping those easy days easy overall, but, um, you know, it's a hard, it's a hard sell for some people, right? Because they don't want to believe that they need to walk. Well, going back to what you said about the story that we tell ourselves, like we, you know, we start in one place and then we are in another place. And, you know, for a lot of people who started out where, you know, they were run walking and they've gotten to a place where they are capable of running continuously. Yeah. It's not easy, but they, that's, that's the progress that they've made to have somebody right. come along and say, well, actually you need to slow back down again. It's. Um, I had somebody tell me that I was insulting them by saying that. Yep. And I'd say, this right. is, this is, I, I'm not negating the progress that you've made, mm -hmm. but I am communicating to you that when we're looking at training for you to achieve the goals that you're trying to achieve, spending that amount of time in that intensity zone with continuous running is effectively a threshold run. Right. And when you do slow down and I mean, I'll raise my hand to, I take walk breaks, you know? So I live in a yep. very hilly neighborhood. 
<laughs> there are some days, you know, and I'm training for Boston right now. And mm-hmm. yeah, there are some hills and I'm like on this run today, this hill is a hill I need to walk. Um, yeah. For whatever reason, whether walk breaks are a regular inclusion in your training or something that you, you know, it doesn't matter. I I know, like we go back to not comparing ourselves to elites or Olympians, but run walk is an effective training strategy for runners of all paces to help them stay in their easy zone, Mm -hmm. no matter where, who you are. Right. Absolutely. And I, you know, I think that this is something that I think we're probably going to be haranguing up on until we die that if you need to take a walk break there's nothing wrong with that and it's probably going to help you in the long run because you're running in your true easy effort zone on your easy days rather than running too hard and getting burned out and uh Mm -hmm. plateauing and then not going where you want to go long term Exactly. And that's what I always ask my runners is like, what are you making it mean? You know, if you add a walking break, what does that mean to you? It's like, oh, I'm, I'm getting worse. I'm slow. I'm, I'm getting in worse shape, right? That's what it's meaning to you. And I said, what if you believed that it was helping you? What if you believed that this, this was making you a stronger runner, a better runner? Would it be easier for you to take a walking break then? And they're like, well, yeah, of course. And I said, okay, then do you want to choose to believe that instead? Because This is what the research shows. This is what your coach is telling you to do, right? And a lot of people, they just want someone else to tell them. You know, like I had an athlete yesterday and um, I said, you know, she's like, I just can't slow down. She's, you know, she's new to the program. She's like, I'm having a really hard time finding L2. I'm like, what I see is that you are trying to think your way to L2. What I want you to do is I want you to feel L2, you know, because we get so in our heads trying to figure it out. Okay, well, what heart rate is L2? What pace is L2? Like, am I doing this right? And it's like, just slow down and connect with your body. Again, go back to that tuning in um, point and allow yourself to feel L2. And she's like, I just can't slow down that much. I said, then I am telling you to take a walking break. As your coach, I am going to tell you (laughs) to take a walking break. And she was like, oh, okay. Like, but there are some people that want or, you know, need someone to tell them this is what you need to do. And like, she sent me a message later that day and was like, it worked. And I'm like, that's amazing. You know, like fantastic. And I said, and how did it feel? She's like, it felt really good. And I really enjoyed the run. Love that. Fantastic. That's, I mean, that, and now we're in business. That's what you, I mean, you said this before too, is that, you know, the number one, the very first thing that I hear from runners and obviously like my, one of my big things is like, I want you to slow down on your easy days, right? The other Mm -hmm. stuff, we can talk about that too, but I want you to slow down on your easy days is how many runners reached out, whether they have bought a plan or they are, you know, in group training or something or just listen to the podcast. And they're like, Mm -hmm. I actually like running again because yeah. it's yes. enjoyable. I'm not finishing every run gasping and feeling like I'm dying. I can run multiple days per week without feeling like I'm burned out or super sore all the time. Right. So we talk about getting you to where you want to go in the process of your training. You need to stack multiple weeks of training consistently together. And one of the most effective mm-hmm. ways to do that is to slow down on your easy days. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I also ask people like, if it felt easier, do you think you would do it more often? And they're like, yeah. And I'm like, okay. And if you did it more often, do you think that you would get better? Well, yeah, of course. Like the more consistent I am, the more I do it, I'm going to get better. Okay, great. So if you think that running easier will make you do it more often, you'll enjoy the process more. And that means that you're actually going to get better because you're going to be more consistent. Then are you willing to allow it to be easy? And they're like, if they can see it kind of mapped out like that, they're like, oh, okay, maybe I'll give this a shot. And I think finally we talk about that long-term progress. And obviously we uh, want to be mindful of the time since we've probably chatted in people's ears for long enough. (laughs) Um, You know, when we're, how far out do you go with your athletes or even with yourself about those big goals? We talk about kind of the goal setting process and you have the lighthouse way out, way Mm -hmm. out there. You know, when we have an athlete who comes to you and you ask, what is your big goal? You know, is it the five-year goal? Is it the 10-year goal? Mm -hmm. Um, You know, how big are we supposed to go on these goals? I think that it depends for each person. You know, everybody's everybody's an individual and that's how I treat all of my athletes. That's how I treat myself, right? Because even when I set goals for myself, I'm like, you know, 
I know that I want to, my goal is to run when I'm 80. You know, that is, that's my long-term goal is like, I want to be that awesome grandma that's like running track events or running trails when I'm 85 years old, right? But what does that mean in the process? That means, so in, if I'm going to get there, I better treat myself pretty darn good right now so that I don't burn out in the process. So I think that it's different with each athlete. You know, there's some people that come to us with, um, you know, wanting to run their first marathon. And I'm like, okay, how long do you think that's going to take you? And they kind of give that to me. And I'm like, okay, and are you open to, you know, a different timeline possibly if your body says that that's what you need? And they're like, yeah, yes or no. And so it just kind of depends on on the person. You know, some people have really big goals. Um, you know, my husband's goal right now is to run Western States, which is like a hundred mile trail race in California that you have to qualify for. And like, you know, that could be a five to 10 year thing. Who knows? Because you obviously have to build yourself up to those ultra distances to run 50 miles, a hundred K a hundred miles, and then to do it at a fast enough pace that you qualify. And then it's a lottery, right? So it just depends on each person. And I think that, um, I always try to have people think a little bit bigger, but some people when they first come in aren't ready to think bigger and that's totally okay. So it's like, let's get them in that first cycle. Let's get them, you know, in a place where they start to break down some of those mental obstacles. And then, because once they start to see what's possible, then for some people, then they can start to see a little bit bigger and dream a little bit bigger. So if, if people come in with like five to 10 year goals, I think it's fantastic, but that's not, typical. Yeah. Typically I say, I see people more of like, this is what I want to achieve this year or maybe even the next two years. But a lot of people don't think long-term. And so I, I have to kind of like guide them in that direction too. And sometimes I'll ask them like, cause sometimes it's easier to think 20 years out or 30 years out than it is to think five years out. Right. So I'm like, well, what do you want to be doing in 20 years? Do you want to still be running or not? And they're like, well, yeah, of course. And I'm like, okay, cool. Let's make sure that we keep that in mind as we plan our training as well. And it's not to say that everybody should have like a five-year plan, right? Because I think as we right. kind of said, like, you know, when you, when you think about these goals that you have that are ones that you're not probably not focusing on in this training cycle or maybe even this year, like you can't, you can't think about it constantly, right? Mm -hmm. Like I, I, somebody else, and I love the phrasing and I think a couple of coaches have used this, like you set the big goal and then you just mm -hmm. like totally forget about it. You're like, I have yeah. this goal. And then you just kind of put it on the shelf and like, it's there. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's something that is, you know, in the kind of in the sphere of your consciousness. Are you thinking about mm -hmm. it every day? No, nor should you be right. Nor right. if you are obsessed with your five year goal on a day to day basis, it's, it's your, you're misplacing your attention on, mm -hmm. on what you're trying to do. Yeah. I mean, it's the same thing with running a business too. You know, it's like, yeah, do I have business goals? Absolutely. But if I start thinking about those on a daily basis, like it can get overwhelming very quickly. So I need to focus on what do I need to do today to grow that? And same thing with our running. I need to, what can I do today that's going to get me a little bit better than I was yesterday? And then once I start adding all of that up, then I have a much more likely chance of getting to where I want to be. Yeah. It, wherever, wherever we end up is built day by day. Mm -hmm. Focus on Absolutely. today. Well, and, and running is one of those things that totally teaches us that. Yes. <laughs> Whether you choose to accept it or not, it's true. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Angie, awesome. this was fantastic. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, I, I love what you're doing on Instagram and, and with your business and clearly you're uh, helping runners uh, of all experience levels try to achieve their goals. If you're not following Angie, you totally should. Uh, I'll put links uh, in the show notes for that. Um, yeah. I, I love talking about this stuff. So I appreciate that you came on and, and talked to I, me with about it. <laughs> I feel like we could talk about this like for hours more, you know? So, um, thank you. This was so much fun. Thanks for having me on.